Hey booktube, welcome to Jackie's Literary Corner. I am Jackie, and if you watch my book tag addiction tag video, then you know I'm off today as I'm filming this. And I'm actually off tomorrow, thankfully, because I have a, I have an appointment, a doctor's appointment tomorrow, and we were hoping I was off. But, um, so it's time for some literary ramblings. Okay, so right now I'm, I'm focusing on getting these two books done before the end of the month, although this one, although I should say this one I don't expect to get done by the end of the, end of the month. I'm not even halfway in this book. I just want to get as much read as I can and then maybe I'll take a break from it um, and read something else. I'm kind of, I'm still kind of in the classics mood. Like, basically all year I've been in the classics mood. Like, I will actually have some um, purchases I'm going to show you that are all classics. But, um, so right now, in this one, I'll just go ahead and talk about this one. So right now, with Fitz, he's on his own. He's alone, by himself. And even Night Eyes is kind of separated from him temporarily. He's gone. He sends to pack of clothes nearby, so he's going to hang out with them for a little while. And Fitz, and Fitz even though he's really sad, it's really hard for him because they have such a strong bond. He's decided, you know, it's better off that we go our separate ways, at least for now. And he also is still on a mission. Get revenge on Regal. Kill Regal. Um, but the problem is that he keeps skilling that whole mod, you know, he keeps using the skilling magic because he keeps checking up on everybody because he misses them so much. And then also his the wit magic, which he found out there, he actually met a group of of this guy who was connected, who was bonded to a bear, and his wife, who was bonded to a hawk, and I think it was a hawk, and they say that yeah, people that are ignorant of what the writ of and don't understand the wit, they call it. That's what they call it, but it's a, under a different name. I don't remember what they refer to it as, and they basically warned Fitz that because of their the bond with night eyes and fits if they keep communicating wit communication then that's going to alert um people who use the skill and other wit users so they unfortunately had to stop doing that for a while and fits finally got to to where regal is currently living in trade ford and it kind of makes me the way they describe it it kind of makes me think of the palace of versailles a little bit because Regal's more, he's more materialistic and, you know, into the fancy stuff. And he just, and so Fitz had to disguise, sneak in and disguise himself and he's poisoning everything and he runs, and unfortunately he runs into Will and Harrod, Harrod, and I can't remember what the other guy's name, he runs into them. And he's still in communication with Verity. Verity is the only person from his life before that he's still in communication with because they skill back and forth to each other. And I think Verity's trying to keep an eye on Fitz, make sure he doesn't do something stupid because he's prone to do stupid things. And I get Fitz's anger in one year bench. I feel like Regal deserves to die too and he Fitz deserves his revenge. But I think Verity and, you know, just like Verity, I know that revenge... It's not gonna, at the end of the day, yeah, in your, at the moment when you're so angry and this person hurt you so bad that, you know, you think revenge will say, say, satisfy you and say your, you know, your pain, but it won't. I mean, maybe it will temporarily, maybe it will for a long time, but at the end of the day, it, it doesn't really, you feel nothing. Like, Fitz, even when he, he kills two of Regal's guards that had helped torture him in the second book, and he even says himself that it didn't satisfy him. It made him, left him feeling empty. And I feel like a lot of times that's what a lot of fiction tries to get, point out that, you know, revenge at the end of the day will just lead you down a dark path, leave you feeling empty. In, like, the Batman franchise, I think that kind of, it kind of does that as well. It kind of whether you're talking about Gotham or the movies or the animated series, although I never watched the animated series, so I don't know. Um, I think that's what the message he tries to convey with Bruce, that his, you know, he needs to, it's just, it's justice he needs to dispel. And I think a lot of times there's a blurred line between justice 
and revenge and vengeance. Um, and I think they, they do that a lot in superhero, other superhero stuff, too. That they, like, look at the difference between justice and revenge. Um, like, so I feel like Verity is trying to stop him because he doesn't want Fitz to go down that path. And also, Regal's still his brother, and I think he still feels a connection. I, I could be totally wrong here, but I still feel like, because Regal is his brother, he still feels like, I don't want to kill my brother. But, I mean... I could be wrong there. He could, like, feel nothing for his brother, for Regal, after Regal betrayed him. But then Regal's gone, like, he, Verity was gone on his quest when Regal took over. And that was Regal's cue to take over, was Verity leaving on his own quest to find the Elderlings. Which, I guess, that's how the whole Realm of the Elderlings title, the whole thing, comes into play. But, um, Fitz is, I, I just, and now he's, like, I feel, you know, he's such a, I want to give him a hug, a hug, and I want to reassure him, I hate that he feels so alone, you know, but he kept pushing everybody away, and, because he was so full of anger, he's still a little boy at the heart, even though he's not physically a boy, he's a man, I feel like he's still a boy. A good quote is, that I think, from Ever After, with Drew Barrymore and Doug E. Scott, the the woman the old lady who narrates it who narrates in the beginning says um about the prince that he's still a boy he was still a a boy in many many ways i feel like that's how it is with fifth he's still he's still a kid at heart and he hasn't matured enough yet to realize that this is not gonna you know like he has a lot to learn and I hope if he can't be with Molly, he finds love with someone else. He did try to, this one of, one of the people he met while traveling, this um, father and his two daughters, one of them flirted with Fitz to the point where she wanted to have sex with him, I think, I'm pretty sure. And he rejected her because, one, he was still mourning the loss of Molly. And I think he didn't want to get another, put another one, another person in a position of, like, where he could ruin her life. And, of course, she gets mad at him about it. She's like, you're rejecting me? How dare you? Because she doesn't understand what he's been through. And then, of course, there's, like, he travels with them because the father is blind. And, you know, they're all the those weird, creepy, um, what are they called? Um, forged, forged ones are running around. So, they're kind of like zombies. That's what I think, like, zombies. Like, in the, um, the two weeks, the, um, 28 Weeks Later franchise, or 28 Weeks, or whatever it's called. I don't know what the whole thing's called. But, um, they kind of remind me of those guys. And he ends up having to, he, they don't know about Night Eyes, so he ends up having to rescue Night Eyes. And he defeats one of the one of the forged ones far away. And of course, this family is fighting without you know on their own is guinea, and they can't. They're not as strong and powerful as Fitz. They don't have any fighting skills, and all they see is Fitz has left them and abandoned them. They don't realize that Fitz is fighting off another another forged one to rescue his wolf. And it just they got so mad at him. It just it just really pissed me off because they didn't. But at the same time, I get they they didn't know all they saw was he left them, and they were in pain and wounded and everything, and they could have died. But at the same time, I can, you know, knowing what I know, I'm the audience, I'm the reader, so I know thing I'm privy to things that the other characters aren't. And I just got so mad. It's like, no, he went to rescue his wolf, and he fought up another forged one, and of course, she still isn't willing to like. She still was not willing to let go of their anger, and he just ditched them. He just. No, I shouldn't use the word. He just, like, left them. Because he's like, I don't want to have to explain myself. And he just keeps feeling like people are just too much trouble. And I, I don't want him to because not all people are bad. Some people are actually good. It's just There's a lot of bad people and a lot of selfish people in this world. And a lot of people who do not understand Fitz. Like, one of his old friends, when he gets to Regal's Palace, he runs into some of his old friends. One, one of his old companions, and they're 
they see him alive and they freak out and are like terrified of him because their stupid superstition believes that superstition belief that you know oh you must be you know connected to the beast or whatever connected to animals like so it's like oh my god I you're a monster and I felt so bad for Fitz and I don't blame him for being angry at this person but um anyway so that's so I'm gonna you know so. I want to read as much. I want to read as much as I can, but I um before the end of the month because I know I won't. I won't be reading it. Like I want. I'm probably gonna take a break from it because I'm still kind of focused on some classics. But you know, now that I've watched Daniel Daniel Green's videos on covers, and not just his, but now I'm as I've said before, I'm focused on covers now covers I mean I will still buy whatever edition I want but um now the covers of these books bother me like I wish I had a better cover you know I do like the cover that I got for the third live ship traders book I like that cover um I mean it's still kind of I think it still has actually you know that cover kind of reminds me of oh god I can't get it in front of me it's in one of the stacks but um that cover what I love about that cover is it look it kind of reminds me of the covers of um the cover of the never ending never ending story movie not the book I've never read the book but the movie it kind of reminded me of that type of cover like where you have you kind of have it like a like a like a pyramid and then you have the faces of all the characters it's kind of like that with like colors and stuff, but um, how? <laughs> How old is the fool though? I'm just I'm looking and obviously Fitz is gonna run into the fool again. Which I thought he was gonna run into him when he went to Regal's palace. But he didn't, surprisingly, he had not. But considering how they left things, it would be very interesting reunion if they bumped into each other. But he didn't. Um, so I'm looking I'm looking at how series sometimes have this, like you know they have a list of all the books or images or whatever for the next and so they run into him again, so I'm wondering how old he is. Granted, in fantasy books, older people can live, could potentially live for a long time. Um, but anyway, sorry, got a little sidetracked looking at those covers. But yeah, I, for some reason, I'm trying not to let it bother me, and I'm not going to buy a copy, because I don't, I feel weird. Although, lately I've been doing that a lot more with all my, with my Dickens novels. So my dick it's like I almost want to a new copy of of a tale of two cities because I have a mass market paperback edition and I want to reread it but I want to reread it in a, a book that's not this small not this size but anyway um but I didn't I just decided to buy some books I didn't have but anyway um so yeah I, for some reason all these covers bother me <laughs> But I don't. I can't justify them buying. And I can't always justify buying new, especially because these are not at my books a million. I mean, some of her books are, but some of them aren't, which is really annoying. Okay, so I'm working. Like I said, I probably won't get very far in that one. I'm gonna get as far as I can. This is the one I'm close to finishing, as you can see. I'm on. Am I on chapter 22? I'm almost on chapter 22. And there's 23 chapters. Yeah, almost on chapter 22. I'm in the middle of chapter 21. There's a few more pages left for chapter 21, and then chapter 22, and then 23, and then I am done. Unless I want to take the time to read the appendix. Um, And I this was a consideration. I thought about buying the second book, The Obelisk Gate, but it's not in the it's not separate. It's in a, in a package. You know, you know those in a box set. 
So I was like, I, I don't need to buy the box set. I just want to get the books individually. And maybe, I don't know if it would be cheaper to buy a box set or not. Is it cheaper to do that than buying these individually? I don't know. But, I wonder if that's supposed to be an obelisk. I guess that's an obelisk. Palace of Dimension. So I think I finally got to the thing that, where everyone said, the part of the book that's like, oh, now it all makes sense. Um, I think I got to that reveal. I mean, I had to. It has to be it, because I only got 20, I only got two more chapters left. Um, two more chapters and a few pages left. So, that had to be it, what, you know, unless there was something else. Which, it was kind of cool. It was kind of cool, though. I mean, but I'm curious how it got to that point, though, is all I'm going to say. Um, but I'm glad I decided to reread. I'm glad I decided to give this another chance. I had a, it's fun, it was really cool. It's very cool. Once I got past the whole second person thing, which I was just watching Elliot Brooks's video, um, I think it was a book haul video, or, and she got another book by N.K. Jemison because she's still not sure about this one. And she also had the same problem. Her reasoning was the same as mine, that the second person was a little jarring, a little bit too much. Um, and I was tempted to be like, you know, I thought of, I had thought about for a second leaving her a comment that said, you know, yeah, you should give it a chance. I also w struggled a little bit with the second person narrative, but, um, and yeah, I don't, I still don't like it either, but once, like her, I still don't like it, but once getting past it and getting into the story, I really like this, um, they actually had a, um, they have a, a couple that's in this, you know, well, I actually thought it just felt like a trio in this, that's, I don't know what the, what the word for it, what the technical term is, for it is not magnanimous, or, I mean, it's not big, now I can't think of the other word. The word for when you're married to someone for life, that the way penguins are, where you, you're married to one person the rest of your life. In this case, it's two people with one person. They're having a little bit of a three-way or menage a trois, whatever you want to call it. And it, it was just kind of funny, a little like, oh, wow. Since I'm, like, I'm fine with, you know what, it's, it's funny that I feel like I'm, like, in books it doesn't bother me when people do it because it's not it's not it's a work of fiction it's not but I would not feel comfortable being in that kind of relationship anyway in real life I would not want to do that I would not be comfortable with that but it's kind of entertaining to read about in a book I mean oh wow you know and it, plus it probably helps it's only a part of a small part of the book it's not like the main it's not like Fifty Shades of Grey this is not about that it's about you know, there's a world is going through going through a kind of apocalypse type situation and so all this stuff is going on the world is falling apart. It, it it's still I don't know if I would be able to sum this up. I might not even give a summary on Goodreads when I finish it. I might just be like you know which I just watched a video the, one of the channels I subscribe to that talks about, like, the importance of classics or how you write something or, you know, like, English-related topics, like, with studying English, if you're studying English and literature and stuff, and he was doing a how to write a good review, and he was saying don't sum up the plot, I mean, and give, like, little, your commentary, but, you know, actually, that's not a good review. I think I'm, I mean, that's how I understand. I could be wrong here. Um, but some, that was something, it's something like that, where don't, like, explain what happens and then give, like, commentary on it. But I would have to watch it again, because I got them at the same time. I was playing Anne with an E at the same time. So there was stuff that I missed. But yeah, so maybe it is good if I don't like do it. I don't have to necessarily do a summary, but just talk about the things that I liked and things I didn't like in the book. But anyway, either way, I'm glad I gave this another chance. It was really, it's really an interesting plot, and um, I would not want to live in this world. But it's interesting to read about, um, 
and I am going to read The Obelisk Gate, and then I can't remember what the book, book I don't know what the third one is. But I would love for this to be a movie. I think this would be a great movie or a TV show. Okay, this one doesn't have it. This one is just... This one, this doesn't have the, um, it just has book one. The Broken, the Broken Earth Journey, that's what it's called. Um, but the, it's so cool, it's still a little confusing, I'm still, I'm still a little bit confused on stuff. The magic, I still don't know, understand it, and understand what everybody is. I mean, there is an appendant, appendix. That I should probably read. Um, but I'm also lazy and it's like, oh, there's too much. <laughs> um, there's actually two append. There's two appendices. Oh. My stupid calculator came up. So I'm gonna finish this today. I think. Surprise! I, I was worried that I wouldn't finish it until till the end of the two weeks of the month, until the end of the month. But no, I'm ahead of schedule. And then I can start reading this one and read as much as I can of this one. And then I also started thinking about my old. These I think are the oldest books on my shelf because I got them even before I came here. Um, before we moved here. This is the oldest, and then this is the second oldest. And it's so, so I need to get back into these. I keep debating about bringing them with me or not. I keep, I mean, the problem is they, again, my thing about big books like this length is they're so big and so long. And yes, I feel like, you know, there's so much that I'm missing when I don't read a big book, a book this size, but at the same time they're a big, they're a lot, they're a big commitment. And like I said, I'm thinking about all the other books that I haven't read yet. Okay, so there's 522 pages in this edition. It's like, it doesn't look that big because of the way it's, but I mean, it's, it is that, it is like over 500, a little over 500. Can I get a photo of it, please? So I need to read, I need, so I grabbed these two and took them off my shelf and was like, okay, I need to read these. Um, and then there's this one, and it was Katie from Books and Things who reminded me, not directly, but I was, I mentioned in a comment on one of her videos that I was reading it, but um, and then she said, oh, I'm loving kind of Monte Cristo too, and because I guess she was reading it too, and that's why I said that, and so I was like thinking, oh, crap, I gotta get back, I've been meaning to get back into it, um, because when I get into it and start reading it, then, you know, it's not that hard to follow, it's not, the only thing confusing is like with Russian classics, where there's names, there's, in this case, French names, that can be a little confusing. And then there's, of course, all these references, historical references and stuff like that, um, of things like Cicerone, someone named Cicerone, someone, he's like, the one character is like, you're comparing me to him, and I don't know anything about that guy. Um, but there's all references to things like that. You can tell this is being relevant, because I mean, like, it's not just the spine being broken, but, and then you get here, and then here. Here, like the the book is very, very well opened up. So, um, and I'm on page five fifty. Not even at the end of the chapter yet, which I normally I don't like doing, because then sometimes you know you're tired, and you need to just put the book down. So, although I'm almost done with this chapter, thankfully, so I need to read another another chapter after this one. After, you know, you take a check of 55, and because I always, 
I feel like I need to probably stop at an even chapter. But this is so good and so much fun once I do get into it. It's just, again, it's over a thousand pages. But it's so interesting. There's so much. I feel like what they. I know they have that movie with. What is his name? Now I can't remember his name. The guy, he played. He played Jesus in um, the Mel Gibson movie about the whole Christ's crucifixion and everything. I can't remember what it's called, but um, I can't remember his name. That guy, he, was, he played in the movie, The Count of Monte Cristo movie, which is a good movie. I enjoyed it. I mean, it's the reason why I want to read the book. But there's so much that happens in the book that, of course, I can't include in the movie. That I think they could, they would benefit from making, if they decide to make a mini-series or a series based on the book, if they did that now. Because it's been long enough that they could. I mean, it wasn't too long after the original, the original Spider-Man movies came out with Tobey Maguire that they made the Andrew Garfield ones. And then they replaced the Andrew Garfield with, with, um, Tom Holland in the Mar MCU movies, movie franchise. But, um, but anyway, um, I feel like, although I don't know who to play the Count. He would be a young enough actor because he kind of has, the Monte Cristo is like in his 20s. Well, he's in probably, I think he's in his 30s. But he starts out in his 20s. So they gotta get a guy that's young but not too young. To play him, but who could? I don't know who could do it. Who can play Monte Cristo if they made it into a series or a mini series? Um, but I would love for them to do that. There are so many books that I what see. My thing is, I, I actually love when they adapt things because I know a lot of people think that they it will never be as good as a book because you know they have to change a lot of things, and when it's a movie, they have to take out a lot of stuff if it's this long. And even books that aren't this long, they still have to take out stuff. And there's stuff that just is, and if it's an older book, there's some, there's definitely going to be stuff that won't translate. And even a lot of modern contemporary books, books that were written today, not, not necessarily everything will translate. There will be some sometimes problematic things. But I still like it because I like having that visual. Like, I know that a lot of people will say, oh, that's someone else's idea. It's not your idea. It's not your imagination. It's someone else's imagination. But I like it. I appreciate it because I can put a face to the character because my imagination is not that good when it comes to reading. Like, that I can, you know, I need to picture, even now when I'm reading, I will picture actors. I will love to see them play the parts. Um... Now, when I, because there's already that one movie with Jim Caviezel, that's the same, Jim Caviezel. Jim Caviezel's the one I picture playing the Count when I, when I read this book. With that, that, with that black hair and that charming, deep voice and stuff. But, um, who's the guy from The Covenant? And he's currently the the guy in the Expanse series. That's what that series is called. Um, the Expanse series. Maybe he could do it. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. He might. I don't know if he can pull off looking like old fashioned like this. I'm trying to think of who could do it. But I don't know. So I did bring this one with me to when my mom and I left for the day to run to go so she could run some errands, and she offered. To let me go to Books and Lane. Because I had, and this was not, in this case, I wasn't just, I was just talking. And we were talking about, like, with this whole pandemic and everything. And I think we were watching, um, um, Ryan and the morning show with, um, Ryan and Kelly. So that's one of my most favorite morning shows to watch. And you were talking about the pandemic. They were talking with some an actor about the pandemic and everything. And your mom was saying, actually, yeah, I'm fine with you know, I'm fine with staying home. It doesn't bother me that I can't go out and stuff. And 
I was saying, yeah, I feel the same way. The only thing I miss is being able to go to the bookstore. And she was like, oh, I could take you. And, and that wasn't, you know, like, I wasn't even saying it. I was just saying that that's the only downside. That's the only thing I miss going to the bookstore on a re- being able to go to the bookstore, like, the roast office on a regular basis. Because, of course, they have a little cafe there, so it's not like you go in for a minute and a few minutes to browse a little bit. You, like, you people want to sit down and stuff and just chill and read their books. So there, but I did, the woman who runs it, Lisa, she, I did see her at my store the other day, and she was like, I'm hoping it will open at least by next year. Who knows, because it all will depend on the pandemic, of course. But yeah, so we went, and I kind of splurged a little bit, but I did work all last week. <laughs> I did work almost every day for six days, so we had a, I owe myself a little bit of a splurge. And I was going to buy um, Shadow Self, which is the thir- the second book in the um, in the Mistborn, the second era trilogy, but I end up not. I keep passing up on that one. Which, what all that is saying is that there's, you know, I had to narrow it down. It was like, oh, well, I can always get that one online. You know, you get to wait until Christmas or my birthday to get that one. Because, you know, I'm in the middle of so many other books. So, and I'm still kind of on the classics kick right now. I'm still very much focused on my classics. And keep me off because I need to add that to my checkbook. So, I got a little nice flirt and got four. I almost got five, but I ended up getting four. Four books. So, third, first, so I have been meaning to reread um, the count of, not the count of Monte Cristo. I didn't. I have been meaning to. reread this series this I mean this book and it was one of these books that at the time I thought I was kind of bored by it but now I think now that I'm a little bit older a little more mature I might I'm gonna read it now and maybe get into it a little bit I might like it a little bit better And I think it does help with the size of the book as well. Um, I had a really small mass market paperback. And I think, I don't know if it's still considered mass market or not. Let me get it. I have to look. Ooh. The Signet Classics edition is the only completely unabridged paperback edition available today. But I used to have like a lot of my, I think a lot of my classics, the few, the class, the few classics I had when I was still living in Maryland were Signet Classics. But I don't know if this would be considered mass market or not because I think mass market is a little bit smaller. I'm gonna check. So I got this, and I, gra- I grabbed this one because I try not to get the regular paperbacks all the time. Like, I try to, if a mass market is there, then my first thought is the mass market anyway, because they're cheaper. But if I already have the mass market, I might eventually buy a different one. Another size one. But anyway, um... So, yeah, this is the... Oh, I think my copy of Tessa Durab- the Durabilles by Thomas Hardy. I know I'm not saying that right, but I don't know. How, I don't know how to say it. And I haven't heard it enough times to remember how to say it. But that one I got from the room stops. My copy of that one, which by the way is a little, little there's a little tear on the back. Like right here is a little torn on the back, but it's not. It's only this part that's torn. Like that's a signet classics. Um, but that's the, that's the risk you're going to get when you go to used bookstores. You might get some of them that are already ruined. Um, but that's okay. As long as they're still readable. They're not so ruined that they're, you can't. But yeah, I've been meaning to get to, you know, reread this and give it another shot. Like I said, maybe, maybe I would like it better now that I'm a little older. So, this is one of the first ones I got. And... 
I also ended up getting okay, yeah, so if this is considered mass market, then that's mass market. Um, and it's also a single classic, too. So I got The Idiot by Dorsesky, Fedor Dorsesky. Um, and this is about a prince, but he is Michigan, who is seen as the as an idiot. And but I think according to um, Kate Pal or Pal, I still don't know his last name, but um. She says that the character, she's pretty sure the character, she said the character was autistic on the, on the spectrum, the autism spectrum. But of course, back then they wouldn't know that. So that's what got me interested in this classic. Because, and I've been liking Russian classics. At least Dostoevsky anyway. And I like the little bit I've read of, um, of Tolstoy as well. But that kind of got me interested, especially as someone that, I might be on, I, I'm not, I'm still not sure, but I think I'm on the spectrum, the lower end of the spectrum. So, I, that, I feel like I want to, like, I would love to see more autistic characters in fiction. But I also particularly want to see them more in, like, fantasy. Now, this is not fantasy, obviously, but I definitely want to see them more like fantasy stories because you don't I feel like you don't ever see anyone you might see characters with scars and stuff but you don't ever see characters with like the invisible disabilities the disabilities that are more mental I mean you might see someone who has something like DID dissociative identity disorder the whole multiple personality you might see that in fantasy but like I don't I feel like I've never come across a fan or I've never heard of a fantasy, now like I said, this obviously is not fantasy, where the main character was autistic. So I want to see that, but there have been, lately there have been a couple contemporary, there have been some contemporaries where our main characters, I'm thinking that they're on the, the autism spectrum, like Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine, she's on it, and um, the Rosie Project, the main character is on it, and um, I'm trying to think of any others. Actually, what the piece? I think there's a few people who like that one. I guess that was cute, and it was kind of nice to see like the main the the person that's finding romance is on the spectrum. And it was also it was kind of nice that the latest the TV series based on um, Anne of Green Gables. The Anne with an E. I don't know if it's this if it's the same with um the the movie slash min, m movie mini series but i think she ha in the show you get the impression that she might have anxiety with what she went through at the orphanage but i've never seen the original movies like the original mini series all the way through i, I watched bits and pieces of it so it's like I want to watch that one, especially because I just found out that Anne with these not getting a fourth season. Netflix in Canada, the Canada Broadcasting Company are not getting along, I guess. But anyway, um, but yeah, that's that's part of why I want to. I'm interested. I was hoping, and I kind of because at first I didn't see it. At first I couldn't find. It. I was like, okay, where is it? And I even asked the woman that I don't. I actually don't know her name, but she's. I think she's the manager of the whole store, and. I get that. I was about to ask her, and I at the time, for some reason, I was drawing a blank on the name of the book. So I started looking around, just double checking, because I only saw one one book by Dostoevsky, and that was Crime and Punishment. So I looked around and looked for that to see if it might have the the names of his other works in it. But then I spotted a few others, like, oh, there it is. <laughs> I wish I could remember. I need to get the woman. I should ask her name next time I see her, next time I get a chance to, next time I go, because I don't remember. So I got those, and then I got some ancient classics. Okay, so I am been, I have decided that I'm going to read some more ancient classics, because like I said, I enjoyed other stuff, like I haven't, I did enjoy Beowulf, 
insert Gawain and the Green Knight, which he read in my British Lich Lit class a couple years ago. They were my favorites, but I did enjoy them, and I found them very interesting. And I'm going to try some Shakespeare. Like, I I actually almost bought some Shakespeare, but the problem with the ones that were there, those those Shakespeare, the copies of Shakespeare plays that they have is, like, the ones that it's their small mass market paperbacks. They're white. I don't know what the company is, the publishing company, but they're the ones, the small mass market that's, the whole cover is white, except for in the center is an image. Um, I can't remember. I don't know what their, their company name is. But I don't want to, I'm trying to not get as many of those mass markets. But, um... Um, sorry, I was looking at the, the books I'm about to show you. Um, so I decided I want to get into some other types of ancient epic poetry classics. So I spotted, I decided to get these two. Like, I was already planning on getting this one at some point. And at first I almost got a, um, mass market edition, because I couldn't see any other edition. But then I found, I spotted this one. I always saw such interesting artwork painting classics. But this is Paradise Lost and in, by Milton and this is basically the story of Adam and Eve in the fall of Lucifer. Um, and that's all I know about it. And a lot of the things that we know about heaven and hell in like as far as our um like what we think of it as because the the book doesn't ever define things. It doesn't. The Bible itself does not say that the fruit that Eve ate was an apple, or that the snake was Lucifer. Um. But. So a lot of our ideas of it come from this book. So or this epic poem. So I've been wanting to read it. And I know that Therese herself has been wanting to read it as well. So I'm probably going to message her today and let her know that I bought a copy. So if she ever finds her own copy, we can read it together if she's interested. But if she's interested sometime soon, in the next few weeks, then she might have to wait. <laughs> Unless I decide to bring this one with me. Um, so, like I said, that's all I know is that it's basically the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and how they got kicked out in the fall of Lucifer, who was originally this beautiful angel and one of God's favorites. But then, according to what I know, he started, he questioned God in, like, according to Supernatural, he was, like, in other fiction works, he, Lucifer didn't understand why God loved us mortals us humans so much and we started questioning because we were so we were far from perfect we were nothing like the angels yet he loved us and so that's all like i said i don't know i mean i never read the bible and i don't know if i ever will because the bible is a lot it's a challenging read this one is a little bit a little bit better because um Because the way it's, even though it, it's, I don't, it looks a little bit easier to read this than to read the Bible. Although not everybody will agree with that, I, I imagine. Um, but this, to me, this is less intimidating than the Bible. And I just never, I would rather listen to the Bible on like a audio book or something if I ever got into the Bible. I ever read the Bible. And then the other one I got was Inferno. And I got one of these nice, these, the um, bargain priced with the fancy covers, the art um, with the, the drawings on them by Dante. And this one is basically about the seven circles of hell. And actually, the, um, the What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams and Cuba Gooding Jr. 
is actually based on this, I think. It was inspired by this. Um, it's like, in that movie, which I would definitely recommend, but that movie, that movie will make you cry. It will make you, it will break your heart. But it's basically about this guy and his wife, and it's their story, and how they get married, have kids, but then they lose their kids in a car accident. And then the wife can't handle it, and he tries to, and the, the guy, her husband tries to help her, help her heal, but he can't, he's not, he can't help her grief, and she kills herself. And, so, but he, or, like, well, actually, first he dies first, and, and somehow, and he ends up in heaven. And then she, because she lost him and her kids, she eventually kills herself, and it's about him going to hell to find her. So there's a lot of references, I believe, to this. Um, but that that movie will make you cry. It's a beautiful movie that will make you cry, and I do love their interpretation of heaven. It's very now I don't know people that are atheists might not like the movie because of that, but I love. Or they might still enjoy the movie and just look at it as another work of fiction. Um, but the idea of heaven in there, in that story, and there's, I think it was based on a book, because I've seen the book. I, I saw that at the roast office, actually. But, and I thought about buying it, but I ended up not buying it. And, um, but the way that heaven is for them is that heaven is individual to the person. The person that dies, and for him, heaven is like the paint a painting. You know, it's a beautiful, bright colors, and it's it's all about imagination. If you imagine you can do something, you can do it, like fly or something. It's all up to our main care, our person, the person that died. It's all up to them how heaven is supposed to be, and I just love. I've always as someone who does believe in heaven and God. That's how I like to see heaven, as however you imagine heaven to be. In either way, whether you're, I think it's still a great movie. I mean, like I said, I don't know if you're atheist, you might not like the movie. But either way, it's a beautiful movie, and it will make you cry, especially if you, you know. Um, but I, th but like I said, the Inferno is kind of based. I think like they use that movie uses the, the ideas of an, that are introduced in Inferno about hell. In that movie. And actually, I think, I do think that the whole idea of what happens to the wife might upset a bunch of people, you know, especially. So, so that's one of my warning. My, I, the more serious warning is that if you are, you know, that might, it will probably, it will it could potentially bother you what happens to the wife. Um, because, like I said, she kills herself. She commits suicide. So, that, and the fact that she goes to hell for it, that might, because that, I could see where that could, the way that that's, like, saying, so what you, that's the only, that's the only thing I don't, I mean, I know it adds conflict and stuff, and gives him a reason, but I kind of, I gotta admit, that part does bother me a little bit. You know, the idea of, like, I'm a little conflicted on that part. And I can understand why a lot of people would be bothered. And you might not want to see the movie because of that. But it's a... But if that, you know... But either way. So that's, the only, so that's the only thing. But anyway, like I said, I bring that up because they use the Inferno for Inferno for inspiration. And I think there's one more book by Dante. By Dante. That's like this. I think I would, I might, I would probably like these a little bit more than Beowulf and Sir Gawain. Because the premises seem a little bit more interesting. The idea of, like, taking the whole idea of what's in the Bible and turning it into, like, a work of fiction, I think is really interesting. You know, and... <sighs> okay, so... That was my my purchase. I kind of spurged a little bit. I wasn't able to narrow it down to just three. I got four, but I wasn't able to narrow it down to four because I almost got five. Okay, let's see. 
case the other one doesn't show up. Okay, so anyway, that's... Okay, as always, I hope you guys are enjoying your reading. I hope you are staying safe and healthy and healthy and doing what you can for all the all the stuff that's going on in the world. Don't like you know, but you're still staying safe and healthy. And if you like this video, be sure to give a thumbs up. Subscribe if you have not already and you're interested in my videos. And if you want to know when I post new videos, then click the bell notification below. And I will talk to you all later. All right. Bye.